Hello and welcome to the opening session of Wise Up, Women and Social Entrepreneurship. It's a three-day series led and organized by Ashoka Arab World's leader, Dr. Iman Bibars, and her spectacular team, including Iona, Claire, Mena, and Salam. Thank you all for getting us here uh, to focus on this important conversation. My name is Diana Wells. I'll be your moderator for this 90-minute session. The title of the panel is called Success Redefined, How to Scale Deep. I'm going to start the session with a conversation with Iman Bibars, and then we'll turn to three spectacular women social entrepreneurs to hear their how-tos of how they have begun to scale deep and, and what that means. So you have this session of uh, uh, description, you have the bio, so I won't do a detailed description, but you will know that Iman Bibars has built Ashoka Arab World from the ground up. She's also co-founder and chairperson of Egypt's first microfinance organization, ADU, Association for the Development and Enhancement of Women. What you may not know is Iman and I have been having elements of this conversation for 15 years as we've had the privilege of working with each other and building parts of Ashoka together. Iman, before we dive into the specific questions for this session, I want to ask you, what brought you to the thinking to develop WISE Women in Social Entrepreneurship and how this session fits into the series? Okay, thank you, Diana. I also would like to thank my wonderful team. Uh, I am always lucky. I have a wonderful team that really helped us do this. And I want to thank everyone who's attending because this means that you really care and you want to change the narrative about women's success. Uh, if you remember, Diana, we started together, actually. Uh, it was a skull event that we had together, uh, and we were talking about women social entrepreneurs. And then we, dis we discovered the percentage of women social entrepreneurs in Ashoka, which was higher, much, much higher than in any other sector. Uh, however, it was not uh, our aspiration because both of you, both of us, want you know at least 50% women. Uh, but we, and then I delved more into it, and the idea was, okay, um, how do women um, succeed, and how do the ecosystem looks at women? And that's when we also did an Ashoka, an overall global survey, uh, which really was talking about the impact of our fellows, and uh, that's where. The idea of, okay, the WISE is not only about electing more women and supporting women. Defining success from a gender lens. Series is part of a whole pro framework uh, that we work in Ashoka globally across the world with many of the countries. And the WISE Up is just one of the activities or our efforts to change the narrative. Uh, um, the objective, really, of the series is to create a movement. I mean, everybody who's following now and all the wonderful leaders with us, we're all concerned and we all want to create a movement to change the narrative about what women's success is and, how, and the impact and how we define it. We want to show, showcase, like the many stories that we will share here, uh, our leaders today, but also the next two days, uh, of women social entrepreneurs who really had a great impact, but maybe not recognized sometimes because the, the mainstream has defined success in one way. And we're going to talk about it later, but we came up with the idea that uh, all social entrepreneurs, but mainly women, uh, they, they, they focus on scaling what we call scaling deep and scaling up, which means changing laws, in addition to scaling out. And we will have examples of uh, our uh, uh, social entrepreneurs who will say that we, they did the three things. They did scale up, out, and, and, and deep. But also, it's very important that we really focus on scaling deep and scaling up in our definition, because this is what women do. Um, and I think a lot of others, but also it is a way for us to prove that women succeed. Uh, and, and we really want to create this movement. We want to create to change the narrative because uh, we want people to identify with and support and invest, because of course it affects investment, all these social entrepreneurs who are women, who are having an impact that may be not recognized. Um, as I said, we are an, a global platform. Ashoka is a global platform of social entrepreneurs. We have around 3,800 fellows, and 40% of them are women uh, in any field. So we're talking about women who succeed and have an impact in any field, 
not just gender empowerment, which is very important, and we want the stories to tell everyone who's listening to us and who is concerned with the subject to repeat the story and to start changing the ecosystem. The goal of WISE itself is to increase the number of women leaders, but also to increase the recognition of women leaders in the field uh, and to, to really, again, I repeat myself, but really to change the narrative. Women do, women can, women succeed in addition to men, but also the way we measure success has to be changed. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, You're mute. When you talk about scaling deep, how is that different from scaling out or scaling up? Uh, okay, based again on our work with our fellows, our Shoka fellows, I mean, to have a 1,800 women across the world who are leading social entrepreneurs, but also other leaders in the field, uh, usually in the, eco in the mainstream, everybody, when they talked about growing, it came from the business sector, which they called it scaling up, which means replication, franchising, and reaching more people. When we delved into the stories of our fellows, men and women, but uh, we discovered that there, uh, there, there is a different definition. Scaling up for us is when you go up and change policies and you change laws and you change um, regulations. And we don't really, um, we talk about, yes, several of, uh, of the women have changed laws, but we don't see the impact of that unless we go back and, and find out that because of this law that was changed, millions of lives were affected. So this is the scaling up for us. The scaling out is the replication and the franchising and reaching more people. And, and it is, of course, a, a type of growth that we do not undermine, but it's one of the ways to have an impact. Scaling deep, we also believe, is what most women do. Most of the time, when women adopt, I mean, they, they, they take a challenge or they, they care about the cause, it's about changing perception, behavior, patterns of behavior, um, the way people think, mindsets. When you do this, that's scaling deep because you're changing cultural uh, ideas or norms or, or misconceptions of, of a certain group of people. And this is deep because once you change a number of people and the way they think and behave, then they change the way their kids behave, uh, the way their neighbors and friends behave. And this is the scaling deep part. When you change the patterns of behavior in a particular society, this happened is very sustainable and it grows generation after generation after generation. And, and, and this is really what we'd like to say. Women succeed because they scale up, changing laws, they scale uh, out, and they scale deep. Thank you. So at, within Ashoka, we've always defined success of our system change uh, social entrepreneurs with idea spread. Very different from business models of organizations' growth or, or budget or, or staff. And... Uh, as as you mentioned, as we looked at our most recent study, if we looked through a gender lens, the biggest difference between men and women's social entrepreneurs was how they were scaling. Um, but, but doesn't mean that men are not scaling deep, and it doesn't mean that women are not, but that there was an interesting statistical variation that was bigger than any other uh, data point we were looking at. I'd like to add one little thing. Not only this, one of the reasons why women spread the idea, as you said, is because when they, are, when they adopt the cause, they go and transfer the know-how. They, they collaborate with other organizations, so they don't franchise. And that's why sometimes their impact is not registered. So, you know, and that's what we mean by, you know, even if you scale out and you reach more people, they don't do it by franchising. They just do it by caring about the idea, as you said. And I think this is very important. Um, and I have done this with my work. Hasina has done this. Molly, who's going to speak, and Sue, because we. And this is another way of how our women, our social entrepreneurs, and women social entrepreneurs in general really have a great, great impact. Thank you. And the forty percent number. Um, I. What's interesting to me about that number is that it starts from the early days of Ashoka uh, when we look. From, from the beginning, uh, when we were working only in South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, Latin America, and Africa. And 
that number has continued over time. We want to increase it. We are doing more, and that's part of, of what the WISE initiative is, is hoping to do, to help raise the funding and awareness um, so that we are getting that number up to 50%. Uh, so all of you joining us today, we hope you will join us in making that happen. Um, I don't know what other field or sector women by virtue of leading organizations based on their own ideas is at that number of 40% leadership other than perhaps motherhood. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, now we will get to hear from our wonderful social entrepreneurs. Sue Riddleston, from the, who founded Bioregional from the UK is having, um, is it not yet with us, but she will, we will get her on. Um, Hasina Harbi, who is from Impulse NGO Network in India, and Molly Melching of Tostan in Senegal. Before I ask each of them about uh, the specifics of their work and how, how they have scaled in which kinds of models, I would invite each of you to share your story about how you got started in this work. Hasina, can you kick us off? Uh, thank you, Diana. Thank you, Iman. I mean, uh, this has come true. I mean, uh, Wise Up is a reality, and I'm so excited. Although I'm speaking from home, I think after we got together in Egypt, it has been, you know, we talk about the endowment, and today it's a reality, and I think congratulations. Congratulations to you, to Ashoka, and all the people, the team who's worked behind it. And I'm so happy that I was there from the initial period, and here I am sharing my story to everybody who's listening today. So, Diana, I just wanted to share something like uh, I started very young. I was 17 when I initiated the process of uh, at that moment. I never I know the thought of what a social entrepreneur is, but I started young because uh, I believe that I could make changes in the community that I, I, I belong and the community that I was seeing. Uh, problems that was there and what I realized starting young as an experience today is when I look back is that uh, when you are young you can make mistake and you dive very deep to find a solution to that mistake and you do not mind making those mistakes so that's the 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 core I would say the greatness of being young so I would say women should really start young because when they start young they tend to go on. It has been a personal experience that I made changes because I went deeper and deeper on the issue and wanting a solution for it. So that was starting young for me and how Impulse NGO Network has emerged as an organization of almost 30 years today. But it all started from that first step of starting young. And uh, going back to uh, the work that I was doing, as a young person and taking up an issue uh, which is close to my heart over these many, many years was an issue on combating you know, child and women trafficking, not only in the state that I come from, but in the neighboring states that is adjacent, which is called the Northeast of India, which is called the Seven Sisters and One Brother, which is very popularly known for that. And uh, I realized that the issue was very, very difficult uh, it required a lot of changing mindset because the institution, the stakeholders, the community were not willing to accept that there was a problem of human trafficking. They were not willing to accept that this happened to the community and to their people. So it was integral part of the process of changing the mindset that it can happen to anybody. So it was diving deep in the whole process of how impulse model came into existence and how impulse model shape, you know, for, uh, today it's like the 12 pillars, which is the six P's and the six R's, which engage both the stakeholders through a partnership. And this partnership was so much to do with collective leadership. Mm -hmm. And that collective leadership engages other leaders to come together to dive deep on finding a solution and the solution became a methodology that I scale out and then 
I scale up further. So as we scale out, we scale up. But this diving deep was something very, very critical because it was already the trust factor that was brought together of the collective leaders, that they believe that there is the power of change. And that was how my journey started, Diana. Thank you. Thank you. Important comments there. Uh, we'll come back to Molly. How did you start your journey in with Tostam? Thanks so much, Diana. But first, I want to bring greetings to everyone from myself uh, and the whole Tostan staff here in Senegal and other West African countries where we work and Senegal where I live. It's such a pleasure to be here with you and with all these wonderful social entrepreneurs from Ashoka and other people who've joined in on the call. Um, I know you're doing such important work and meaningful work, which is so great. Uh, I arrived in Senegal actually as an exchange student at the University of, uh, in Dakar. Uh, when I, and I was only going to stay for six months when I first came in 1974. Um, but I loved it so much here. I just was, I felt right at home and I just couldn't leave. And so now I have been here for 45 years. And actually I now have a Senegalese nationality, I'm happy to say. So while at the university in Dakar, I did a master's thesis on the importance of using national languages and also African ways of learning and knowing. And that through familiar and really engaging methodologies, such as traditional poetry, song, dance, and theater. And as I had done research in rural areas, you know, I realized how girls and women, especially who were living in these remote and resource poor environments, were so often wanting so desperately to learn and get information they weren't uh, receiving, and especially in their own language. And this is life-saving information. And they just didn't speak French, and they, were, they often dropped out of school, out of formal school. And so what I realized that there was a need for an education program that was really more adapted to their needs and to the realities um, that really better would express their worldview and allow them to, to, to express their idea of well-being for the future and what they wanted. So after having learned Wolof myself, I was in Dakar, but then I moved to a village, a small village that is about an hour and a half from Dakar. And I lived there for three years and was able to make a lot of mistakes. As Athena said, when you're young, you can make lots of mistakes. And, um, and you just say, you know, doesn't stop me. I'm going to keep going. Um, even though I realize I made a mistake, I learned from it. And so you can go deeper. And this is what I did. And together with that community actually was able to, um, to develop a three-year basic education program and national language um, for them. And then eventually that led to doing it in many other languages also, actually 22 national languages, uh, African languages. Um, that was really uh, relevant and really culturally based for with information and skills that would support uh, youth and particularly women and girls uh, to be able to achieve their own priorities for the future. And that program is called the Community Empowerment Program. It was initially funded by UNICEF. And in 1999, um, we went from being consultants working with UNICEF on this program to forming TOSAN, the NGO, which means breakthrough in the national language of Wolof, as I said. Uh, it's really the hatching of an egg. It's the spread. Uh, once the egg hatches and the chick becomes the hen and lays other uh, eggs, and there's just the spread of knowledge and education, but the idea of it coming from within, that egg which is nurtured with all of the nutrients and um, the warmth of the mother hen. And so we rely greatly on African cultural methods and traditions as part of our program, positive traditions. Thank you, Molly. That's, thank you. It's been a long journey, uh, and you see how the knowledge builds uh, on, on every step of the way. 
Hasina, I'd like to turn back to you. Your Megala model, um, I know, has scaled um, into the Impulse NGO network and to three neighboring countries. What was that process like, and how, how did your work become set the standard uh, that is now a, a benchmark uh, and framework of how to address trafficking? Not only in these three countries, but uh, what, were, what were the steps that you took to build that model? Um, and how did it move to, the, to three more countries? Uh, Diana, I mean, uh, so like I started very young and I was looking for a solution when the problem of human trafficking uh, came about uh, and we were organically uh, taking up different steps uh, to find a solution. Mm -hmm. So the way the Meghalaya model emerged in the last 18 years, uh, it actually grew because uh, we use a legal framework as a tool mm -hmm. because working for human trafficking and working for crime, uh, the most important, uh, you know, when we talk about changing mindset, it becomes critical that we had to have the legal framework of the country I come from, which is in India, in which we had to change the stakeholders understanding on the human right principle women's right and children's right of what they should do and why they should do it. So taking the legal framework was initially the step and the tool in which the Meghalaya model was diving deep to find solution. In the process of finding solution, the P's from three P's, it emerged to six P's today, which is partnership, protection, policing, press and prosecution, which engaged collective leadership from all these sectors that they have to come together and have a single window platform so that a solution can impact the lives of women and children mm -hmm. and actually gives back the right of women and children who are vulnerable to human trafficking and unsafe migration. So that was one of the major focus that because it went deeper, we found that who are the stakeholders that has to come together? We realized the pattern of engagement and also realize that unless until these stakeholders comes together collectively and envision the larger vision that we have to work together, it would have not been possible for us to scale out. Mm -hmm. You know, so we scale up first to the eight states of the Northeast of India that I come from. We went deeper in every state, taking the context of each state's and in 2012, when we got the Global Development Network most innovative de you know, development project in the world as the best solution and a tool, we decided to scale out. And we went to Myanmar, and then it went to Nepal and Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. But when we scale up, we also you know, went further that we need to engage the deeper engagement of collective leadership. Mm -hmm. And today, the model is called the impulse model which stands on the 12 pillars, which I mentioned the six P's and we have the six R's, which is the action on the ground where the stakeholder, you know, come together to participate, share the resources because shared resources are sustainable. Mm -hmm. Collective leadership is sustainable. And uh, because we dive deep, we realize that there has to be leaders in all these countries, in all these states. And I think the true success today is also about generation equality because it was both men and women that were brought together in the platform. Mm -hmm. It has been tough to get more women, but we've always looked at a gender equality perspective that we need to work together. And uh, as we went further, I think the hybrid model, which is the impulse social enterprise, started diving deep again because we realized that unless economic livelihood is not being provided as a support system, migration will continue, unsafe migration will continue, and vulnerability will continue. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a balance about diving deep, you know, when you dive deep and you scale up and you scale out. Mm -hmm. But the core principle of diving deep becomes the 
method of engagement mm -hmm. of collective leadership mm -hmm. for us. Fantastic. And Sue, so you just joined us. So I can a brief uh, update on we've gone through um, Molly and Hasina have both commented on how they got started. And uh, Hasina has just, made the point about how starting young, as Molly did as well, uh, helped build the muscle uh, to begin this work, to be comfortable about making mistakes and picking up and learning from those, as well as uh, scaling deep as changing mindsets and norms that help uh, build trust and engage stakeholders at the table uh, so that it becomes easier to change mindsets by scaling up and changing legal frameworks. Also the point about collective leadership, that that is key to sustainability. In your work, Sue, uh, in, as founder of Bioregional, um, and a framework that is affecting 30 billion of real estate around the globe, I understand, um, which is probably a, a low number as of last week. <laughs> um, can you tell us how you got started on your journey? Yeah, it's, <clears throat> sorry not to actually be on the stage earlier. I had some technical difficulties, which your team figured out, but I could hear the rich conversation. Uh, and it's wonderful to be here uh, with these other female social entrepreneur leaders uh, and be part of this event. Uh, and uh, I think in terms of getting started, it was very much seeing the need and seeing it from the perspective of, I think from a female perspective, although my co-founder was a man, um, very practical, uh, very applied. And it was very much, we're having this collective impact on the world, which is destroying nature, um, creating all this carbon pollution. And at the same time, so many people don't have enough. So how can we problem solve our way through to finding how we can live happy, healthy lives within the natural limits of the planet, which we then came to call One Planet Living. It's this idea that we can, the average European or the average person in any sort of reasonably wealthy lifestyle consumes, if everyone lived like that, we'd need three planets to support us. So what we need is One Planet Living, where we can all live well within the limits. And, um, I guess got started by creating these practical things. So I'm speaking from an eco village in London, uh, which has been built for 18 years now. And we, we built it because we needed an office, but also then we live here too. And then we found everyone was very impressed with this um, project and asked us to, could we help them to do their vote? It's called BedSed. Everyone said, can, can you do a BedSed for us? So that led us to creating um, a framework, this one planet living framework, which you mentioned, uh, to system, kind of systematize what we've done so that other people could just use it. And we made that open source, uh, although we continue to work on our own sort of like beautifully crafted projects, we continue, I think it's very important to continue have to have the, the sort of real life experience, even if you've done it already, you can always keep improving. And, and so we always keep working on more projects, but other people can just get on with it. And so I was saying sometimes it's impossible to actually work out our impact because it's just out there and people, I come across people who say, oh, we used your One Planet Living framework or oh, I've visited Bedside or I've studied it on my course or because it's just gone out there and it's just used. So I guess that's how we got started, practical demonstrations making it available and then trying to use it to change policy as well so i think we might come on to that oh i can't hear you it's a great example of how social entrepreneurs lead to get the ideas and solutions into the hands of people who need them most um, and uh, perhaps something 
a dif differentiating point between business entrepreneurs, despite there being lots of correlation between the entrepreneurial drive that drives both. Molly, I want to turn back to you and hear more about Tostan's community engagement programs. Uh, and you are credited innovating a community development technique called organized diffusion. Can you tell us what is at the core of this model and how organized diffusion works? Sure. Um, actually, organized diffusion uh, is a way of scaling, um, but actually the scaling is done really from within, but the people themselves. And that was happened because Tostan was able to implement a three-year program. We actually um, did deep scaling first. Uh, the deep scaling involved giving the information and the skills, the knowledge that people needed, particularly women and youth um, who had never been to school, who dropped out. And then they, with this, they it provided them not just with the skills and knowledge, but also with an empowerment, with the agency to, you know, have confidence to stand up and uh, you know, defend their human rights and to achieve the well-being that they actually identified as part of the uh, part of the program. It's one of the essential things we do is start with what is the vision of the people? Where do they want to be? Listening to them very deeply and supporting them to achieve their own goals. Now, that takes a long time. And many donors you know, would say to us, um, you know, can you shorten this project uh, or this program and make it like six months or a year? And it, you know, make it cheaper and you know, it's a wonderful thing, but uh, just make it shorter, a year is good. And I look at them and I say, now how many uh, years were you in school? Um, to be able to do what you're doing, uh, 18 years, 20 years, 22 years, 25 years. I don't think three years for a woman, you know, who is eventually, she is going to be leading her community, doing income generating projects. We want them to manage their income generating and community development projects and even to effect change on a higher level because we have now 20,000 women, at least 20,000 women, who are in leadership positions at the community level, not just in women's groups, but in women and men's groups, and at the district level. They've been elected to the district council, and in order to do that, it takes time. It doesn't happen in six months. It doesn't happen in a year. And so um, we really believe that a holistic program that covers governance, leadership, health, the environment, economic growth, all of that is interconnected. It's so important. And in order to make real systemic change, you need to cover all these areas, give people a chance to discuss this. And so we have always refused. We say, no, it's, it's three years. And in fact, we have added now, we have early childhood development and we have a peace and security module and it's become another, you know, another year really. And we could actually do more because people deserve a right um, to education. So it's involved a deep learning. And then once the participants do this deep learning and have that information, they become the ones who spread the knowledge. They have reached out with the new information, with their new confidence. They have become the facilitators going to what we've seen is that change happens a lot by people going to their interconnected social networks, people who matter to them, who are usually relatives or part of their ethnic group that have the same traditions, the same practices. And when people decide to change things like female genital cutting, which they many of our thousands of, of our participants decided to abandon, but they realized they could not do it without getting the buy-in and the collaboration and making this a collective unified decision, because otherwise the sanctions would have been too harsh. Their children, their girls would not have been able to marry. So that was really important that they be the ones who reach out to their interconnected community. And so they did internal scaling. And then we scaled up too though, because um, this approach was so successful 
and leading to more than 8,800 communities now that have abandoned FGC. And all of our ex internal and external evaluations have really shown that it has been successful, which has led the government of Senegal to actually adopt this strategy for their national action plan. So it shows you though that it, when you have a model, and I go back to Hasina, she said having a model is important. And then others can see that. And right now we're scaling out, not only implementing in other countries, but we also, we offer a 10 day training seminar to try to share uh, with other NGO leaders and religious leaders who come to our center. Over 600 have come in the past five years. We've shared with them uh, and they of course don't, um, take the model as it is, but they adapt it to their own programs. And I think a lot of them are on, um, the, on the call today and they're absolutely amazing and have integrated many of the aspects into the, their own wonderful pro programs. So we do all three, but it starts with the deep. The deep is the most important, I totally agree. Then you can and do the up and you can do the out and you have a model to show, uh, communities to visit, women to talk to who are the leaders who are making these decisions. It's so powerful to see it, just amazing. It sounds like that's where the learning happens to be able to take the next step. Sue, I'd love to turn to you. Uh, and I, in recognition of the, all the work that you did to build this and push uh, the UN to get to the Sustainability Development Goals, SDGs, how were you able to build a framework that was be able to change both individual and organizational mindsets and big institution mindsets? Well, I guess um, our experience with One Planet Living is the way to, uh, is the process that we use with it as well, which is very much, I was very struck by the similarities with what Molly talks about, that uh, we co-create plan and it's, it's and kept very simple our 10 principles of one planet living are you know health and happiness community nature things that everyone can understand it's not mystical and it's fun and uh, people can work together and then get a buy-in to own actually own it themselves and they've created it themselves just use populating this framework towards achieving one planet living so i guess that's how we found it works really well in sort of our own projects and, for, and letting other people use it. We always tell them this is the way that's going to get the best results. Uh, and when it came to the UN, um, there was a time in my life, uh, in all of our lives perhaps, when we actually went past, we, we, we used to think, oh, we're going to get climate change in the future. And there was a time about 10 years ago when we realized, and I heard directly from an IPCC scientist, that we'd actually passed the point where we were actually now experiencing climate change. And that was a big shock to me. Yeah. And I felt it's no good just um, keep doing these demonstration projects, just got to go straight to the UN. Uh, so started off going along to the climate meetings and then realizing this is a very complicated, long drawn out, well-established process. And um, some other organizations which facilitate you in to the UN system helped us to understand where we could get involved, which was the UN Rio plus 20 process. So 20 years after the Declaration on Sustainable Development, they wanted to have a new uh, framework, a new, a new approach for 2012. So back in 2010, uh, just turned up at the meetings. And I think that's uh, what I've, <laughs> I've had such an interesting fun life and work to just sort of get involved in this UN process. I was very lucky that we, at the time, we had a little bit of um, unrestricted funds that we could use to pay for this ourselves because I don't think any funder was, no funder was very interested in helping us to do this. So we just used our own money and I recruited a person to work with me. And then the way that it seemed to work was that we just got involved in the process in a big team. So although I was there as Sue from, we were there as Sue and Freya from Bioregional with our case studies of how it can be done uh, with these real projects with attractive pictures and stories, 
making it feel like the, this is a positive possible thing. Mainly, we were just part of the big UN team and we had to sort of let go of our organisational branding and ego. And although, and we just had lots of events, got to know each other and all, it was about relationship building with the governments and the dip, all the diplomats and just talking to them on a human level. So uh, we ended up, first of all, we championed the sustainable development goals, working with three women, I must point out, uh, from the governments of Colombia, Guatemala and Peru, who were the first initial champions of the goals. Uh, and then once we got the goals, we particularly championed sustainable consumption and production, which is a terrible UN term, but it basically means, well, I guess you can imagine what it means. It means one planet living in effect. And uh, so we ended up getting an official role and we crowdsourced. So we, we took a lead to write uh, some text um that because by then we become very sensitive to you know what the latin american countries care about and the different sensitivities of all the different nations so there's a very much sort of empathetic is that the right word approach um and worked within a big uh, consortium of ngos called beyond 2015 we proposed some suggested approaches discussed it on webinars with groups from all over the world but we just took a lead and got on with it and then presented that I presented that to the co-chairs at the UN of the process uh, and then later on that day they said we like it we're going to use it <laughs> oh, wow and we've managed to get this this thinking this one planet living thinking into the SDGs um, so I'd say the key thing there which i'll just i've said but i'll say it again was just letting go of ego being sensitive to other people and working as a team in a in a sort of massive collaboration towards this shared goal to get these outcomes and i love the sdgs because they're the closest thing we've got to a, a plan for the better world we all want to see and when i sat outside when it was all being agreed there were mid midwives there who had work to get child mortality addressed in there. There was somebody who dealt, dealt with disarmament who was pleased with what was in on that point. You know, it's a huge amount of content in there. So let's just try and achieve them by 2030. And Sue, I'm so glad you also mentioned the funding piece, that the it was the unrestricted funding that helped you get that leap, make that leap um, at a moment where you saw the opportunity without having to wait for a grant cycle and making the case. Uh, so for any of those listening today who, who are in the funding realm, take note <laughs> that, that Susie came with the power of some flexible funding that enabled her to jump right at the moment when she saw the opportunity and how that jump uh, enabled a level of scale. Um, I would, I'm going to ask you each um, to reflect a little bit on how being a woman helped or hindered how you overcame uh, issues that you saw as related to uh, your being a woman in leadership. And I'm going to start with Iman. <laughs> um. I wasn't expecting this. Um, I, I actually think um, that the beauty of having all these wonderful women with us all through the next three days and today is that we are women and in spite of the challenges we won, we overcome, overcame the challenges. And I think this is important to inspire younger girls and younger people because, of course, as I, I'm an Egyptian woman, I'm an, uh, you know, I live in Egypt, and there were many challenges that I could have, that I probably faced. But the point of being a social entrepreneur is that you see every challenge as an opportunity. And Molly here going to a strange country, Hasina going and discussing trafficking, Sue going to the UN directly. Um, of course, uh, you know, that is not an easy thing to do, but we have overcome the challenges. And I think a lot of my challenges were that I started very young. When we started the Association for the, for the Development and Enhancement of Women, uh, uh, everybody, every single person was making fun of us, actually, that we were westernized girls because women are never alone, that men take care of women. And we had to tell them, no, we work in squatter areas. And this is 
there are women who are heading their households and we even created 10 types and they have no one to go and they have no choice. So everybody made fun of us, but we continued. Uh, then when we started giving microcredit, because we were able to read about Grameen Bank and we did it, we Egyptianized it, everybody said, ah, you're going to take interest rates, you are terrible people. So again, we were attacked, but we continued. Not only did we continue, we did exactly what um, Hasina and, and Sue and Molly said, we collaborated. You know, when you said people, we spread our ideas, we didn't franchise. We trained a lot of NGOs in Egypt, in Morocco, in Jordan. Uh, we, we started to share our experience. Uh, we started to look at the legal existence of women. So, you know, there are many challenges all the time. And of course, if you're a woman, anywhere, by the way, even in the United States, you are always having some gender issue stopping you. Um, but the lesson I think we're coming up with uh, we, from this series is that in spite of that, we succeed. And in spite of that, we change. So. What happened? Your, your pictures disappeared. Hasina, any any comments you'd like to make about challenges you've overcome in doing this work, starting young as a woman? Advantages, disadvantages? I think the, the advantages is that um, you don't give up when you start young as a woman. You, you, know, you continue, you are consistent, you move towards making that change because you are... You know, you, there's always that heat inside your heart that say the gut feeling is I have to do it. And that is one thing that comes when you start young. And the other part is, yes, I mean, uh, I think all over the world, uh, women always, fa always face, you know, challenges as women leaders. I also face the same when I started, uh, typically of the fact that uh, I had to make system change when I was diving deep to make law enforcement and uniform personnel to understand that human trafficking uh, is never a choice that women make and it's not prostitution. And they were looking at me as this young girl is, what is she trying to tell us? You know, I mean, uh, you better grow up first and then you come and tell us what system change has to be done. So I realized that very much that there are simple things that I had to take up in my in my way of taking it forward is that I even change the way I dress. You know, I would be dressing very maturely and and really, really maturely to go in front of all the uniform personnel to make them listen what I was trying to say. So that was itself one step of challenging the norms of gender, you know, gender, I mean gender equality for me. Second was making them listen because the legal framework was a tool because we dive really deep you know in getting the 12 pillars but as i went forward and uh make um process and progress even when i was scaling out you know and also scaling up there were always these different challenges but the challenges change over time so the challenges that later came in is that uh raising resources, raising money is never easy for women uh, because we would go by the core principle that we want things to change in a very holistic way. And that was the next challenge that I was facing to raise the money because there were more of Project Mote funding that was out there and there were very less uh, you know, donors who would be interested to fund innovation, which is very deep and it's already gone scaling up and scaling out. So for me is that I had to change that norm. And surprisingly, uh, I succeeded because I said I will not be motivated by a project. I have to make this change happen and you have to invest in this innovation. And it took time because I was a woman and they felt that my maths might not be great. You know, they felt that my financial understanding of making these things work was not that great because they felt I was driven by emotion. So it was mm -hmm. the trust factor that came from the collective leadership in the course of time that made me overcome. And if I look back today, it, it's surprising because I have a lot of young women who are also part of the process of the organization and partners and others. I would give the same example of how I went about it, 
but today is like I can walk out in jeans and walk up and and people would listen to me. I mean, at the level of getting bilateral agreement, I didn't really have to to do what I did, you know. So I think I overcome that very much. But then I look back at it. I said, hey, today I can go in jeans and sit down and say this is how the policy has to be done. But I remember the first step. They thought I was this young girl who was trying to make things happen. And it's a man's world. It might not be directly spoken, but it was the indirectly put forward, you know? So that is the element of challenge that I overcome over the years. Thank you, Hasina. Molly, any reflections on both the, the, the asset and advantage and the yeah. disadvantage? How, how you um, well, I came to Senegal, you know, as a young woman, and, and so it was quite different because I had just gone through 68 and uh, <laughs> years of women's liberation, and so I had a lot of learning to do in a very conservative Muslim society, and I made a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning, um, but I was really, I was really curious because I loved the people, they were so kind and welcoming and generous and open. And I said, you know, I, the misunderstandings I was having is not because of them, it's me. And I need to understand more. And I came speaking French and I learned very quickly that I needed to learn the language. So as soon as I started learning um, the, the, the language that is spoken the most here in Senegal, which is Wolof, I, it made a world of difference. I suddenly started being able to respect people know more, knowing how to greet people properly. And I was accepted because people were shocked that I, I spoke very good Wolof, that um, was, um, I had a very good professor <laughs> who very much emphasized the need to speak deep Wolof, uh, a beautiful Wolof. And I was lucky I, I got to learn and work with children in a children's center. And so um, I think, I dressed appropriately also. I think that's so important. Uh, I, you know, Hasina talked about it. I started wearing booboos and long skirts and dresses, but of course I love that and I'm very tall, so, you know, it worked. And then I think when I started the program, you know, we originally, we do a lot of work on human rights, but originally as being a woman, I came in and said, okay, we're gonna do women's rights. You know, when I realized how we were doing research on women's health, and when we realize that we cannot do women's health without first people, that women have to know they have rights to be able to be able to really use those rights and apply them in their daily life. So we went in with women's rights and guess what? You know, um, that was not the right approach. I mean, it should, it involves listening. The right approach because the men of course were upset, they were suspicious, they closed down centers. Mm -hmm. And so um, we started listening, what, why, what is wrong? And they wanted to be included. And we realized um, we made a mistake because we really want a society where men and women are working together and partnering and youth. So we changed and we wrote our whole program in 2000 after um, 91 to 2000. We sat down and we changed from women's rights to human rights. And suddenly it made this amazing difference. Um, and I'd say that, um, you know, I learned a lot. I and mean, I think um, I learned as a woman that it's, it's much easier to work with men and to have them engaged. We have these, we have religious leaders who are engaged. We have the traditional leaders, but it's listening to them, including everybody, making them feel that we're all part of this together, whether you're, originally from America or Egypt or and that we all have to do this together and human rights, I'm a big um, advocate of human rights and proponent of human rights because it unifies us all around the same principles and values, uh, guidelines for living our lives. And we saw it in the field because we went from men being, you know, really opposed and angry, uh, I mean, seriously, uh, burning tires and marching against us to actually embracing our program and um, becoming very involved and being doing their their sermons, their hutbas on Friday on supporting women's rights and women's engagements. Mm -hmm. so, you know, it's I think um, you learn from from listening, 
from really caring deeply to understand other people's perspective, having a certain empathy um, in the work you do so that uh, the, the change comes from people and it's not an imposition, but rather working beside people and helping them to achieve their goals for well-being. And, and Molly, your commitment to both learning the language and being there and listening, I'm sure propelled uh, deep trust and uh, an ability to move further. So, and, and, and an in, interesting, you know, e in each of these stories, I'm hearing there are moments when you're positioned as an insider and positioned as an outsider, and both have advantages to move the needle. Sue, any reflections from you as, as uh in your work and being a woman and, and leading? Definitely. Um, I think sometimes it's hard to know, is it me as my personality, my character, or is it because I'm a woman? And some, I find it quite hard to sort of tease out which is which. Um, so I'm not sure if this is the right answer, as it were. Um, and I have sort of known about um, Iman's work uh, and, and seen some of the uh, conclusions so I think Iman should come back and remind us all in my opinion what they are but um, <laughs> so don't forget um, but I think one of the things for me is um, I think I care and um, I think women just hormonally <laughs> are naturally a bit more nurturing and uh, I've had people say to me you know it's either I'm either nurturing people at work thinking about their development, their career, or in a team, sort of nurturing a team of people towards a goal. Uh, and, and maybe that's something to do with, with being a woman. Also, I think my life is a bit, maybe women's lives are a bit more blended, just because we're the ones who give birth to the children. And when I was starting out in this work, I had young children and got involved with women's environmental network looking at and i was ended up becoming a board member of this um campaign organization looking at environment from a woman's perspective and uh so that gave me a bit of confidence to that there is a different perspective which i definitely brought into my work and as i say i feel like my it's very hard to tease apart my my life and my work and i don't know if that's something for all um, women compared to men, although I think things are coming full circle in that men are get, are, can get more engaged in the family now. And so I was often thinking about the issue from a householder perspective uh, or from a family perspective and also to keep it simple and understandable and not some demystifying demy career job that you have to make as complicated as possible. I, I just want things to be as simple as possible and as practical. And I think um, a couple more points. I think as a woman, I think especially I'm five foot two and a half, which is not very tall, and I'm a bit mumsy and nice, you know. And so I think that means I'm not challenging compared to say a, a man in a suit. And I have put a suit on to look the part. So in that way, a, you're not as challenging, and so you can start, you can ask for help, yeah. and people give it more readily. I think um, you can be a little bit disarming in your approach, and they see, oh, she's going to help me in what I want to achieve. Um, but on the negative side, sometimes, hang on a minute, I said that, and a man in a suit who's tall with a booming voice will command more respect. These days, I find I've got an OBE from the Queen and enough awards that people take me seriously. And so I could just be myself, which is wonderful, <laughs> and come on events like this and, and talk about this. So I just encourage all women to just, I think there's something about, I've tried to stay true how I feel things should be done, mm -hmm. how I, what I feel is right. And I've been able to, because I started my own organisation, co-founding, but I, you know, I've been able to infuse the working environment here and the way we approach things with a slightly different approach to others. Another just final point is that I think sometimes because I want to hear what other people have to say, I want to see other points of view and I want to create a sort of um, collaborative decision making 
and I have had been criticised, you know, even somebody will say, just make a decision, you know, and it's not that I'm indecisive, it's more that I, th I actually want to hear the views of other people in leadership positions that I'm working with and just let it go around in my brain and then make a decision and then it will be a better decision. And so I think, I don't know if that's quite a woman thing, female thing, but that is definitely something that I've been criticised for, but I've also been praised for and seen the value of. Thank so you. I guess those are some of my perspectives. Thank How you. About you, I, you know, How about you? Sorry? How about you, Diana? <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> um, you know, so much of what you all shared resonates. Starting young really helps um, to get over uh, the Im imposter syndrome, feel of, fear of failure. Um, and, you know, I have been blessed with wonderful leaders to inspire me, wonderful colleagues to continue to inspire me. Um, and I... I resonate with the balance of how family is a balance um, that makes this work real and pragmatic. Um, and uh, commitment comes from there as well. Um, and, you know, I, at Ashoka, we, uh, we really believe that um, young people teach us a lot. <laughs> And I heard it, I heard uh, Molly reference working with young people as part of how she learned wall off well. Um, and I having uh, that perspective is about open collaborative leadership. It's also about uh, not only nurturing but being nurtured by young people and their questions and the future they they have. When we started to think about impact and how social entrepreneurs have and demonstrate impact, we've looked for measures of systems change. But we've also looked at how they've changed mindsets. And so much of the conversation today is just about that. And beyond the individual work that you're each doing, that you're inspiring others we're getting some feedback in the in the social media and chat about uh the inspiration you're providing just in this conversation today and and how important that is for young people for other women to learn from the journeys that you've had and thank you for sharing those the other piece is we recognize one of the things social entrepreneurs are doing is building a world where everyone can be a change maker because you're inspiring people, because you're creating roles, you're inspiring others to be involved and you're creating mechanisms and things for them to do so that they can be change makers. And that uh, to recognize that, I wish we had an algorithm to, uh, to calculate just how many people our network of nearly 4,000 social entrepreneurs have inspired and, and affected to be others to become change makers, but we don't yet. <laughs> um, so as we move to uh, think about and bring us back to this uh, remarkable moment and sobering moment that there were, we are going through globally right now, and the threats, the health threat, the financial threat, the recognition of the need to really rethink radically inequality and how, how we all do much more to ensure that everyone can be a change maker, that we tackle racism and inequality. Uh, I, I can so clearly imagine and see the deep work that you've done now um, being so incredibly important in a post-COVID moment that the ideas and trust and shared leadership that you've built um, sets you up to have a next phase of, uh, of impact. 
I want to go through quickly because we're we're getting to the end time for each of you to have one last uh, round, uh, and then I'm going to turn to Iman uh, for a wrap up and and to give us a sense of what's ahead for the next couple of days. Um, Molly, do you want to start this time? Uh, any any uh, sort of what happens in this rebuilding post COVID? We've seen so much, so many systems fail uh, in some countries more than others. Um, any thoughts on the relevancy of your work uh, and the urgency of your work? Right, thank you, Diana. That's such an important question and it's so hard because everything is so uncertain. Uh, it's such a surreal time that we're in. So, so unusual and who would have ever thought, you know, in all the years that I've lived, I would never have dreamed that I would be living through something like this. One thing um, I can say, we immediately started thinking, well, we have to work from home, but you know, one thing that we do do, we've done lots, so many pedagogical materials and national languages. We've worked in 22 national languages. So we immediately started talking to the, our village participants, our facilitators and supervisors and realized that no materials had been done for villagers. Everything coming out was like for Dakar, for the urban centers. And so we looked at the social norms that were happening in the communities that would make it very hard for people to respect uh, some of the most important ways to prevent the coronavirus. And so we did a, a brochure, a 20 page brochure that we did in, we've done it in 14 national languages now, African languages, and just finished the one in Somali for Somalia um, with, our, with our training participants. So that has been a great experience and it shows me the power of what we made them open source and we have so many people using them and now World Reader picked it up and as they've sent it to around the world. And I, you know, it opens up so many ideas on how we can share more materials in that way and spread what we're doing. Um, we have other booklets we've done in, in national languages, but we could do even more for people who could use those. And I, that's been huge for me. But then the other thing is that um, we found that we established community management committees when we go into a, a, a community. And so there's this whole leadership and most 80% I'd say of the community management committees are led by women, but men are part of it also, but they're very organized. And what we found is that this has been a wonderful model for others to see, like even people who have um, written to us and said, you know, we learned about that uh, organizing a community management committee that's holistic, not just a health, not just a health committee, not just an education committee, but one that is um, there to represent the whole community uh, that we do so much training for, for income generation. Now on decentralized, decentralization, we're doing um, uh, really in-depth information on how they can be elected to the the, the, the district council, what the roles and responsibilities are, how they can hold them accountable. And it's been wonderful because we have continued to be in direct contact with all the villagers through the community management committee. We have a, an organized group to go to so that all the issues related to health, to education, um, to the environment, all these different uh, aspects, it's a holistic you know, approach uh can we can have somewhere to touch base with um doing that and so we're recognizing how important that is and how we need to go deeper another deep dive into making those more sustainable listening carefully to them and what can help them in the future to maintain uh, this wonderful um, committee which represents local government and then can now is advocating on the district level for services and for uh, infrastructure that they need, uh, building, you know, schools and health posts or health um, huts for their communities. So that is, I think, where we are going to be really focused um, after COVID. Hopefully, hopefully, as we as we also as we are, are scaling, we are scaling up, and we're sharing our. We're going deeper about sharing our program with others. We're going from ten days to a three week training for. Uh, the wonderful NGOs we work with in Nigeria. And so mm -hmm. we're 
looking forward to, to doing that and uh, seeing how we can you know, scale deeper. Um, mm -hmm. Well, and it sounds like even this moment has been a learning opportunity for you to continue and build important new things uh, related to your impact. Oh, yeah. Sue. Yeah. yeah, I think, um, as you say, Molly, this is just an incredible moment. Very, very strange. And uh, I think it's made everyone think what's really important because, you know, if you haven't got your health, if, if your family are dying, if you're losing your job, what's really important? And I think as horrible as it is to say, that obviously clearly is an opportunity uh, to push forward what we've all been doing to create that better, fairer world. As you say, inequality, Diana, is is a huge part of it too. And for me, obviously, for the work we do, um, COVID is, is a disaster, but the climate and ecological emergency is already affecting people all around the world and it's getting worse. And so that is almost like the big troll under the bridge. If you thought COVID was a troll, this is even bigger. And so I think for me, the, for us and, and for me, that it's about transforming our world. It's about um, all the jobs, all the things, rethinking, revisioning the communities in that sort of just and fair way as people, before they forget that they've enjoyed seeing and hearing nature in our cities with you know, not so many cars and planes and, and all of this. Um, and every country's experienced it differently, I know. Um, so for Bioregional, uh, we've been responding by turning our training in One Planet Living into a digital offer. And that's really growing uh, very fast. People are really keen to do the training so that they can use it for their community, for their organization. So uh, we're hoping to really ramp that up and do more on that. In terms of scaling deep, we've um, worked for a long time in communities where we are based in the UK, in London, in Oxford, uh, especially in Brighton, Bristol, around the sort of southeastern part of England mainly. We've, we've worked because that's where we are. Um, and I think continuing that work and supporting local governments and local businesses to really try to implement this transition on the ground where we are is then also a good story to show, oh, here's how it can be done that we can use for scaling up and, and scaling out. Um, and obviously also building the sustainable, affordable homes that we do. Um, but in terms of really trying to make a collective impact outside of our organisation and sort of reach that North Star uh, of what we want to achieve, uh, I've put a lot of energy into Catalyst 2030, which is a big network, social entrepreneur led, involving Ashoka Social Entrepreneurs, Skoll, Schwab, Eckering Green, but it's collective, it's led by us. And uh, we are working together to accelerate progress to achieve the SDGs by 2030, because it's the closest thing we've got to a plan for the world. And so we've only been started up a year ago, actually, and we are launched uh, in January. Uh, any social entrepreneurs welcome to join in. A lot of the Shoka people are involved, as well as all of those other organisations. <laughs> uh, uh, so welcome, anyone, welcome. Uh, and what we're trying to do is raise the profile of social entrepreneur approaches, social entrepreneur solutions, and our expertise. Like we're not, we're very, we're sensitive that we're not going to say to the government, do our, put in place our solution. We're, we're like, oh, we've got we've got expertise. You want to achieve these things. We've got some ways that that can work. Let us work together. And we have had some milestone moments. Like last week, we had the uh, UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed uh, responded to the report that we've just produced with recommendations on this very topic. You know, how do we go post COVID? And she said she will uh, discuss with the Secretary General about social entrepreneurs, and she will look at how we can be weaved into the system, those UN systems, because you're either an NGO or you're a business. 
the social entrepreneurs bring the sort of practical business thinking uh, and pragmatism together with the idealism and the vision and the caring nature of the NGOs. So, you know, we're, it's just a perfect blend for them if they could ever get their head around it. So we're going to try and <laughs> explain. And I mean, when I said they don't understand, you do need to talk to them. So, um, so that's a big way that I think social entrepreneurs can. Thank you for raising that. Catalyst 2030. Um, it has been a very uh, inspiring effort um, in a moment to bring so many of us together. Um, and I also heard Amina Mohammed uh, make the point that young people also have to be at the table, uh, which was in addition to social entrepreneurs, which was, was thrilling. Hasina, a few uh, short comments from you, uh, just so I can turn to Iman to help us wrap up. Um, any any comments about this COVID moment? What you're doing? What what's the urgency ahead for you? So the for, for me, the urgency was that the organization has to sustain. So we, we look a little bit inwards, uh, the team that was part of the entire process and taking a, uh, taking a very strong decision that uh, for the next till December, we'll work from home was one of the major important decision because we also have a lot of young team and we also have a lot of partnership that we had co-create our work. So that was very utmost important. And I felt that as a leader, if our team doesn't survive, then the work outside the organization can never survive. So it was a very important part and an important decision that was being taken. Uh, the second part is that uh, uh, it gave a lot of time for me uh, to actually reconnect with our partners and the challenges that all our partners, our state partners, our country partners are facing. Uh, during the COVID situation right now, the lockdown in many countries that we are working, uh, even in the different states that we are working, and understanding that what would be the sustainable plan that these organizations and leaders can actually overcome. So that's very critical because we are working on preventing unsafe migration, uh, providing economic uh, solution uh, through our hybrid model uh, in ensuring that impulse social enterprise will be uh, the solution that is an add-on to the model. Uh, the third, as I conclude, is that uh, it was critical to see and understand both the men and women leaders who are part of the collective leadership of our model that got replicated, uh, it got scale up and scale out, and it, we are diving deep again right now on a solution. And the collective solution is a very important as I have conversation with each one of them. But I've seen that because it was collective, there were initiated by each of these leaders at the communities that we're working, the stakeholders that we're working. So it, it is very, very fulfilling that I am not going to leave this solution alone. And we are trying to co-create at the moment. So the co-creation of solution, of innovation, in merging, uh, has evolved during the, you know, I mean, it was already there pre-COVID, but now it's becoming much more stronger that we're looking at livelihood, like working with artisans and working with biodiversity uh, in the fact of how the environment and climate change, innovation and our innovation can merge so that we can we can prevent unsafe migration. So the co-creation and that collaboration uh, is a very thoughtful process that was happening during, uh, I mean, during this time and looking at those partnership and diving deep, what will be the solution that we can come through together. Thank you. Wonderful. And I will now turn to Iman uh, to for last comments and closing. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Diana. Uh, we started this uh, trip together, and I, in the journey, Hasina was part of it uh, when we wanted to do the endowment, and then Sue. We had wonderful times in London and Paris, and I'm so grateful to have met Molly recently. Uh, I think a couple of things. I think the, these stories that we just heard uh, will answer one question, because this, I think, is what really it was important to me. Why should people invest in women? And I think... Uh, when we asked this question, the answer was, but women don't have, they don't scale up 
the traditional way, they don't reach more people. And I think these stories today, and I think the objective of these, the WISE in general, and WISE Up in particular, as I said earlier, is a movement to change the narrative about success, to redefine success from a gender perspective. And really, I would like the NGOs and the, the donors in particular, the philanthropists, the universities, to come on board and, and help and work with us to redefine the narrative and, and say that, look, women do scale up, out, and deep, and they have a large impact in every one of them in thousands. It's just that the way we present it sometimes is not the, the mainstream way. To, to wrap it up, there is a common methodology among our three leaders here, uh, and it's important for the impact. They, they all wanted the buy-in. Part of the methodology of really having an impact is to get to work from inside the system, not outside the system, because what you really care about is you want the buy-in of the sheikh, of the priest, of the important leaders, of the people of the climate. But also all of them talked about collaboration and no ego. Uh, the goal was not to franchise, the goal was to spread the idea as all social entrepreneurs or most of them, but it's very clear in the cases today. And of course, not confrontational, at least at the beginning, you know, and it's not because we are not confident, it's because we want things to be done. So instead of, you know, you know, so we're not confrontational. We don't choose language. We don't choose women's rights. If it doesn't work, we can use human rights as long as we're going to get women's rights. We dress in a certain way at the beginning and then afterwards we can go and in jeans, like Hasina said. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but, I, but I don't think that this is because we are nurturing or soft. No, I, I, I think it's because we are driven by causes that needs that. Uh, I think women, all of the stories here, we are concerned with causes that needs a mind shift. We are concerned with changing the climate or human rights or, or, or trafficking. So I think the reason why we're using these methodologies as women social entrepreneurs is, of course, we're nurturing and wonderful. I'm just joking. But it's really, but it's really because of the causes we choose. And, and this whole story is not about women versus men. It's only about women uh, succeeding, and, and we want to be recognized for this success in a different way. Uh, I will go quickly. Sue, for example, you scaled up. SDGs in the UN is a huge scale up. And if we count numbers, as Diana said in the beginning, it will be in millions and millions. You scale deep and you collaborated. The open source framework is scaling up. It's not in a franchise way. And you change mindsets of organizations. Molly, you scaled out in the communities, 8,000 communities in other countries, but you also, the organized, the organized diffusion is real scaling deep. This is where people adopt your belief. It's like a religion, you know, and therefore they spread it. And you scaled up because the government of, 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 uh, of Senegal adopted your model. So here we are. But do we go in any presentation and say that? We usually talk about our activities. This is what we need. Hasina, my, my colleague, you scaled out in the countries. You went to Myanmar, for God's sake, and, and India and other places. You scaled deep because you made the communities accept these girls, the trafficked girls, and you provided them with an income, and you made the public opinion accept what you're doing. And that's why you also scaled up when, when two or three or four governments uh, you know, accepted your legal framework. Yeah. So I'm just saying that this is a sum of these are the stories we want people to hear. We want donors and universities to hear. And I, I just want to go quickly that tomorrow we have the leading wisely, which is about young change makers, the young girls. People, please listen. There are young girls, very young girls, who, are, who want to change the world, and they did wonderful stuff. So tomorrow is leading wisely, young change makers shaping the world. Uh, it's 4 p.m. GMT, uh, dismantling systemic racism on a global level. This, you have to see it because we are saying that women have already found solutions to systemic racism, you know, and including, and, and mostly in America and Europe. And um, listen to the women guys because they have the solution. So tomorrow it's also 5.15 p.m. GMT plus two. Uh, it is dismantling systemic racism. The day after, South led stories of impact. We're saying that, yes, we want to hear the stories of women, but we also want to hear the voice of the South. Because, you know, when we talk global, it's not only global North, it's also global South. And I'm the moderator of that one, of course, you know that.
South Bend. <laughs> and then the final, <laughs> the final session um, for now is called the word, a wiser word, uh, the redefining impact. And I think this also will include a lot. The last session includes a lot of the enablers. So we will have uh, fund uh, donors and universities and uh, and shakers and makers and what Ashoka calls the Jitsu partners. So that will be in the last uh, session. Um, I would like everybody to join and to, and to ask others to join. And, and I'm really grateful for all the people, uh, uh, the 140 at the beginning who joined. But I just want to say that this is not the end. Uh, after these sessions, uh, we will have a round table. And the round table is about, okay, what is, what is the responsibility and the pledge of every one of us, uh, of every woman, of every organization, of the donors, uh, the ones who should give, uh, like, you know, an unrestricted funding um, and should really believe in the power of what we're talking about. Because at the end, we want to empower every single social entrepreneur in the world, but of course, we also want to, them to recognize the impact of women as wise. We want to elect 50 percent uh, of our, to, you know, to have 50 percent of our, our cohort. I mean, of all our fellows, women. We want we we have uh, the, uh, we have collaborative funds between the female fellows, and also we want to collaborate with the universities and other Jitsu partners and publishers and the media to change the narrative about women's success. Uh, you know, <clears throat> we all are equal. We, we don't differentiate between men and women, but we say because of the causes that women adopt, because of the type of work we're doing, that's why we are, we are, do, we are succeeding, but in a different way. Thank you. Thank you, Iman, and congratulations for uh, the three days ahead for your work on WISE. It's been thrilling to be part of this um, session today to be with all of you, continuing to learn how to scale deep um, and to recognize the remarkable work that women do, but also all social entrepreneurs in changing mindsets as, and uh, that doesn't always get recognized because it's not about branding, it's not about budget size or organizational size. And uh, we have to begin to see differently so we can do differently because this is the kind of work that sticks, that's sustainable, that really drives change in the long term long-term irreversible change. So thank you for giving us this opportunity to have the conversation, for joining us, for persevering through technology glitches and connectivity <laughs> and the reality that we're all living in. Um, I'm grateful for these moments uh, where we can come together and build for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And enjoy you. The, the next couple of days. Yeah. Uh, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.